to ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us today grounded in truth because we want to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. So we want to be led by the Spirit. I'm just a vessel, so hopefully I don't speak any mistruths, but it's very possible. So we want the Holy Spirit to speak through me, and we want it to be grounded in truth, which is the Scripture. So let's go before the Lord in prayer, and I'd ask that you say that personal prayer as well. God, we come before you this morning, I come before you this morning, Lord, just asking that you would uh, make yourself known to us and that you would just share your grace upon us, Lord, shed your grace upon us that we might be able to see just a glimpse of who you are and that you might speak to us today through your text and your word, Lord, that it wouldn't be me who's speaking, but it would be you who's speaking, Lord, and that you would fill this place with your spirit and that we as your people would be able to leave these walls and not only spread the gospel from the Great Commission standpoint, Lord, but be able to pick up our cross daily and follow hard after you. We want to see your name lifted high in this place, and we pray this all in your son's name. Amen. All right, so, you know, I usually don't get nervous with clip crowds. You guys, for some reason, speaking at Calvary Vision Church makes me nervous. I don't know why. I, I, I texted my dad this morning because my dad's a pastor, and I said, I'm praying for you. You pray for me. <laughs> so he literally just texted me back over there, and he goes, okay, I'm praying. And I was like, well, aren't you supposed to be preaching at this time? Maybe he pulled out his phone and typed it out there in his sermon. But today, I get the privilege of obviously carrying on in this series of the Messianic prophecies. But there was a thought that I was meditating on last night and this morning as I woke up. And it was this thought of how blessed are we, each and every one of us, to have the opportunity to get out of bed this morning, come here as friends and family, fellowship together, worship our Lord through songs that we just sang and then worship him through the reading of his text, and we're not persecuted for it. We can come here free. There are people waking up today, I promise you this, waking up today around the world that are going to be worshiping the Lord in secret today in fear of their life because they're persecuted, and we're blessed. And the reason why that thought was on my mind is because, and this is for all the teachers out there, I don't, after going through this, this is my second time doing a sermon because the first one was really a testimony. I don't consider myself a teacher now. Now I realize teaching is intense because this journey of teaching teaching, I told Megan, I said, man, it's one thing to listen to scripture, read scripture, hear sermons. I've listened to tons of sermons now on the deity of Jesus. It's one thing to hear it. It's another thing to comprehend, internalize, practice, understand, and then the teaching, this third dynamic of being able to not only understand it, but then eloquently be able to teach on it, for lack of a better word. And on this journey, and I don't know if any of the other teachers out there can attest to this, but it is really easy to get discouraged. It is really easy to hear the voice of Satan saying you're not qualified, that you're going to speak something that's not true and be judged for it. You're going to say something that's embarrassing. Like it's, it's very easy to feel that, especially because you're kind of stepping outside of your comfort zone and you're giving and when you're giving of yourself, it's very easy to get frustrated. And I think this is the thought that just popped into my head because we're talking about the deity of Jesus. And this is what was resonating with me as I was going to bed last night. Why? Why am I doing it? Why did you show up here this morning? Each and every one of you. Why did you drive here? Spend your gas money. Spend your time. Why? And I'm guessing and I'm venturing to say that you're like me. You're here and you're venturing to do this because you believe in Jesus. Because you believe, you believe that not only in Jesus, but you believe that he's the son of God. That you believe that he's divine. Because why else would we be here this morning? And what I would share with you as I have listened to hours upon hours of sermons and in, in studying this and trying to wrap my head around how do I in 30 minutes to 40 minutes talk about the deity of Jesus and, the, and then obviously we have the messianic prophecies that we're studying and it's what the prophets prophesied in the Old Testament and Jesus fulfilled. 
how, how do I encapsulate this? And one question kept coming to my mind. And it's the essential question of our lives. Who do you believe Jesus to be? Who was Jesus? Each and every one of you in the seat, myself included, and sorry if, I, if you feel like I'm preaching at you. I'm kind of just, maybe it's my nerves, passionate. But who, who do you believe Jesus to be? That is the question. And don't be surprised as Christians because we're here this morning claiming and, and believing that Jesus is divine, Jesus is God, Jesus is deity, because deity means God, it means supreme, it means creator. We're believing that. Don't be surprised that the greatest attacks on Christianity are on the deity of Jesus. The greatest attacks in apologetics are on the deity of Jesus. Why? Why? Because if people can devein the gospel concerning the deity of Christ, meaning if you can separate Jesus being God's son from the gospel story, you have nullified the gospel. Josh McDowell says all you have to do is disprove that Jesus rose from the dead and the gospel is untrue, that all of Christianity is untrue. So it is obvious that we as Christians, the greatest attacks will be on the deity of Jesus. But here's what's so interesting as I studied this, is it's not usually super clear. It's usually very, very minutely off from the Jesus of the Bible. It's, it's actually presented in a way that makes Jesus seem, have you ever heard people say Jesus is a good prophet? He's a moral guy. He's all about love. False teachers and false Jesuses they're very, very easy to come by. Even in evangelical circles, you think of the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel and how close that is to, to the gospel and how easy that is to believe in. And I, I read this from Josh, uh, or John MacArthur, and I thought it was really good. I want to read it to you guys because I think the question that came to my mind is the deity of Jesus is going to be attacked, so how do you know if you're following a pastor, a church, a ministry that is following a true Jesus or a false Jesus. How do you know? And John MacArthur wrote this, and I love it. He says, devotion to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ is the benchmark, the litmus test of legitimacy in any preacher, in any ministry. If there is any diminishing of Christ or deviation from the true Christ, there is a serious violation of the purpose of God's revealing scriptures, both in the Old Testament and New Testament. Listen to this. Any and every legitimate preacher, le legitimate church, legitimate ministry must be committed to the truth about Christ to the glory and exaltation of Jesus Christ, and this is what I love, being relentlessly biblical to understand the full revelation concerning Christ. Here it is. The single source to the truth about Christ in the Bible. If the theme of the Bible is Christ being revealed and the purpose of revealing Christ is so that all of us can see the fullness of his glory, then the legitimacy is tied extricably to a consuming preoccupation with knowing all that has been revealed about Christ, to understand his full glory with a view to worshiping him, honoring him, and loving him. If you're not getting what I'm throwing down, what John MacArthur is saying here is that if you want to make sure you're following in a ministry that is worshiping the true Jesus, a Jesus that is the Son of God, then you will have an all-consuming obsession and preoccupation of understanding the revelation of Jesus. And how do you know Jesus? You know him from his word. And how do you know his word? You have to dwell in his word. And so for a church that loves Jesus, if you walk into a church today and want to know if they're following the right Jesus, if they're worshiping the true Jesus, do they have a love for his word? And are they grounded in his word? That is the litmus test for all of us to know if this is the true Jesus. And what I want to do today is I want to walk us through what other religions say about Jesus. I want to walk us through, I actually did, I, I uh, looked at some Gallup polls and the Barna group did a survey of the American people and what the American people say right now about Jesus. But then most importantly, I want to walk us through who Jesus claimed to be. Because the reason why I think that is so important is because if we believe Jesus was a historical figure, don't we first want to start with asking ourselves, who did he say he was? 
And so we want to look who Jesus said he was. Then what I want to do is I want to look who others who knew him, the people around him, who did they claim? Because I can tell you guys right now, I'm the most handsome guy in the world. I'm intelligent. But the truth is, that's me saying who I am. But it'd be nice to ask Brenda or Juliana, right? You use the witness of people who knew him, people around him, to help corroborate the story and the evidence. And so we want to look at what people claimed. And then I want to present to us the great trilemma. And it's not my trilemma that I came up with. C.S. Lewis really presented this. And it's a question that we all have to wrestle with and deal with. And if there's an application I, I want us to get from this sermon, is each and every one of you has a choice to decide who was Jesus, who he is to you, who do you believe he is. Understand, not making a decision is still a decision. Indecision is still a decision. So even if you don't want to go study who Jesus is, even if you don't want to claim, oh, I'm not going to decide today, you are deciding today. Because how you live your life will directly be of consequence or correlation to who you believe Jesus to be. So let's start with what other religions say, if this actually clicker works. Can you go to the next slide? Let's start with what other religions say Jesus was. Awesome. Awesome. Now, I love apologetics. I'm not an apologist, <laughs> but I love apologetics. And in researching this and listening to people speak about what other religions say Jesus is, one thing stood out to me that has never stood out to me before, and I don't know why. Do you guys know that every other major religion honors Jesus? It is very, very interesting. All false religions reject the true Jesus Christ of the Bible. That's what obviously classifies it as a false religion because it uh, rejects the Jesus of the Bible. But from Islam to Mormonism, every major religion honors Jesus. Think about this. In comparison to Christianity, do we honor false prophets? Do we honor Muhammad? No. Do we honor Buddha? No. We don't honor false prophets, but all the other religions honor Jesus. Muslims believe Jesus was a true prophet, a great moral teacher. Mormons believe Jesus was once a man but worked his way up to God and was brothers with Lucifer. Jehovah Witnesses believe that Jesus was the first creation of God, the Father. They all put Jesus in a pedestal of honor. And why I think this is super important and a good tangible takeaway for us is because Satan is the great deceiver. He's the father of lies. So he's doing this on purpose. Purpose, I believe. He, what he's doing here is imagine if they separated or bifurcated and made Jesus demonized in the Jehovah Witness religion. And they said Jesus was a terrible man. He, he was evil. How easy would it be for you to look at Jesus' works and go, well, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't really line up with what his teachings were. It seems like he was all about love. I mean, it seems like he was a pretty good man. Instead, they purposely, Muslims, they know, I believe they know, that if they demonize Jesus, then it would be easier for people to stray away from the Islam religion or Muslim religion because it's so much easier to then see that, wait a second, who they say Jesus is doesn't really line up with his teachings. Instead, they say he's a great man. And I think that's super interesting for us to, to mark in our minds that that's how the devil works. He doesn't make things black and white. He makes them very gray, and it's easy for us. And, and you know how it says in the Bible that you know, drifting into evil is a slow fade. It's not an instant fade. And I believe this is how the devil works. Next, let's walk through what the Barna group did. And what I pulled here, the, the most recent research I could find was 2014. So it was like August 25th through September 10th, 2014. The other stuff that I could find was like in the 1990s. And this is basically they go out and they survey a bunch of Americans and ask them, who do you believe Jesus to be? And I'd be interested to, if all of you guys went to your workplace and asked the people who they believe Jesus to be, what answers you would get. The first question is, was Jesus a real person? Meaning, is he just a pop culture icon in the Da Vinci Code or South Park or something like that? Or did he really live and walk this earth? And you can see very obviously that literally 9 out of 10 people believe Jesus actually literally existed. And this is important because now when you're sharing the gospel with people, understand that 9 out of 10 people you're going to talk to believe Jesus existed, so they really have to deal with the question of who he was and was he actually who he said he was. 
I will point out millennials. Who's a millennial in here? On every question, I'm a millennial myself, on every question, the millennials are lower and lower, and I think that's a sign of the decay of what's happening and how it's slowly eroding. So just a, a challenge to all of us millennials out there. Next question. We can go to the next slide. Next question was, do you believe Jesus was God? Do you believe Jesus was divine or divine? And it's interesting, people are super confident that Jesus existed, but not nearly as confident in the divinity of Jesus. Most adults, not even 6 out of 10, believe Jesus was God. So about, about 56% would say Jesus was God. While about one quarter say he was a religious or spiritual leader like Muhammad or Buddha, and the remaining say that they aren't sure Jesus was divine or not. So 9 out of 10 believe he existed, little bit about half say he was God. Next question is, do they believe Jesus was sinless, is what they asked. Do you believe Jesus ever committed a sin because Jesus Christ was human? And just like they were so conflicted on whether or not Jesus was actually God, what we see from the research of looking at the American people They're just as conflicted, if not more, about Jesus sinning. About half of Americans agree strongly that while he lived on the earth, Jesus Christ was human and committed sins like all other people. Just less than half disagree, either strongly or somewhat, that Jesus committed sins while on earth, and 2% aren't sure. And again, what's interesting is the millennials are more likely to believe Jesus committed sins while on earth. we got to step it up. Millennials. So, that's where the American people... So we, so we found out what other religions are saying about Jesus. We find out what the, um, the American people are thinking about Jesus. So let's actually find out what Jesus claimed to be. And it's interesting, there are a ton of cynics and attacks on Jesus being actually God and being one, you know, in the Trinity with God. Because there's verses in the Bible they claim where Jesus says he's not as great as his Father, which is true. There's verses in the Bible where Jesus says he doesn't know when the end times, only the Father knows where the end times. There's verses in the Bible where the word begotten is used. Jesus is the only begotten, which they claim is, you know, he, if he's begotten, he's created. He's not from the beginning. So we don't have time to go through a, it would be neat to go through a whole study on those because those, if you study them, you can go research it on your own easily or disproved. But let's walk through very quickly because what I want to do here is prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that you cannot deny that Jesus from his teachings and his life claimed he was divine. It's very important to understand this. So first, I want to take us, and you guys can turn there if you want to in your scriptures, but you don't have to, and I'll read it to us. I want to take John 8, 58 through 59. And it's where he says, I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him. The Jews picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple ground. So this verse right here is a powerful double claim that's happening in this verse. First, Jesus is claiming that he pre-existed human birth and was actually alive and present as God before Abraham. So can you imagine if I was in front of you guys today because a lot of times we separate the Bible from real life because we think it's kind of like movies or something like that. But can you imagine if I was up here and I was telling you guys that I existed before 1988, August 22nd, 1988? How crazy you would think I am, right? So, so it's not surprising. I don't blame the Jews for being very up in arms. So he's claiming that he existed before Abraham. And then again, He's using in a second that his title was I Am. And everybody who studies the Bible knows that I Am is the same title used for Jehovah God in Exodus 3.14. This is why his listeners, the Jews, got the point very easily that this guy is claiming to be God. And that's why they picked up the stones and wanted to stone him. So that's the first case. And I'm going to move through this quickly because we don't have a lot of time. And I want to make sure we get to the points. I and, the father, I and the Father are one, is the second where he claims. John 10, 30 through 33. I and the Father are one. Again, Jews picked up the stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? And then they said, we are not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy. Because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Now here is what we should recognize from this verse. It is super clear because Jesus is talking to highly educated people. His audience understands the scriptures. 
they understood he's claiming deity, and they only literally have two possible responses. One is they can bow down. And if you remember from the prophecies of the Magi coming and bowing down and worshiping, so they have the same option. They can bow down to Jesus and his claim of deity, or they can reject him, and obviously they chose the latter, and they, and they rejected him and, and tried to persecute him. But the interesting thing here is he did not argue their accusation. Jesus did not argue their accusation. It was accurate. He did not argue them accusing him of claiming to be God, which is him saying, I am God. Next, I am the truth. This one's a little interesting. I was doing a study with Josh McDowell, to, about the deity of Christ and everything. And Josh McDowell pointed this out to me, which I thought was really interesting. Obviously, John 14, 6 is when Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Josh McDowell is huge on the definitions of words. And he says, words mean something. You must study the definition. So he asked, what is the definition of truth? What is Jesus saying when he's saying, I am the truth? What is the definition of truth? And what's interesting is Josh McDowell goes, he pulls the Webster Dictionary out, and this is the definition of truth. That which has fidelity to the original. The definition of truth is that which has fidelity to the original. So what's the obvious question? Well, what's fidelity, right? So fidelity is the same as or equal to the original. So now put in that definition when you read that passage. I'm the way, the truth. I am the way, and I am the same as or equal to the original. And then Josh McDowell, and there's more to this study, but I want to give you the flavor of it. The, who's the original? Yahweh. Yahweh is the original. And there's a whole study you can do on this truth, but it's so interesting how it aligns. So Jesus, in essence, when he's saying, I am the truth, he's saying, I am God. I am Yahweh. I am the original. Next, he accepted worship from his disciples. Matthew 14, 32 through 33 says, and when they climbed in the boat, so this is when the storm and everything was happening, and the winds then died down, then those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, truly you are the son of God. What you guys have to understand is the context of the time right now and it, where they're at and, and worshiping, this is a Jewish culture. The Jewish, Jews believe adamantly in one God, one God. So the fact that they worshiped him they acknowledged that Jesus was divine, and again, Jesus didn't correct them. He did not say, don't you realize I'm a moral prophet? Don't you realize I'm just a good man? Here's why I say that. The contrast that's given to us in scriptures is look how the disciples and angels reacted when people tried to worship him. I'll give you two quick examples of how the followers of Christ reacted when people tried to worship them. If you look in Acts 10, 25, this is to give you the context. This is when Cornelius has the dream and has a vision, and, and, he, and God's telling him to call upon Peter. So I pick you up here in Acts 10, 25, where Peter is coming to the house of Cornelius. So it says, when Peter was called to Cornelius, as Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter, this is Peter's response versus Jesus's. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. So then, here's another example for you. This is in Acts 10, or sorry, Acts 14, 11. This is when Paul and Barnabas had just done some great things. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice saying, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas Seuss and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. Then they started you know, bringing oxen and garlands to the gates and they wanted to offer sacrifices. And then in verse 14 it says, but when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their robes, they rushed out into the crowd, crying out and saying, men, why are you doing these things? We are also the men of the same nature as you. We preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to the living God. The contrast, therefore, is, is when Jesus gets worshipped, he embraces it and accepts it. When his followers, his apostles, get worshipped, they reject it. And that's a huge contrast for us because that's Jesus claiming, I agree with you worshipping me. I deserve your worship. I am. I am God. Next, moving on, we'll go to the Gospel of Mark. Now, the Gospel of Mark is the oldest of the Gospels. 
And the Gospel of Mark is all, if you read the Gospel of Mark, it's very clear it's all about the deity of Christ. Now, it's not coming out in every passage where Jesus is claiming to be, you know, God until the very end. There's like a climax when Jesus is put on trial there, and right before he gets crucified, there's a climax there. And so, just to give you just a few more verses to really drive home this point, what I'm trying to do, just to bring you back to me, what am I trying to do right now? What I'm trying to do is, beyond a shadow of a doubt, tell you, you cannot deny that Jesus, nine out of ten Americans say he existed? Well, guess what? You cannot deny that Jesus claimed he was God. From his teachings and what he wrote, you cannot deny it because we're going to be faced with a trilemma because of this. Okay? So, Lord, uh, our ability to forgive sins, Mark 2.10. So, in Mark 2.10, it says, but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Well, who has the authority to forgive sins? If you look at the prophet Isaiah, again, in the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 43.25 says, I, even I, God, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. So again, he's saying, I have the authority to forgive sins, but it's only God that has the authority to forgive sins. Then he goes, Lord of the Sabbath. So, Lord of the Sabbath, Mark 2, 28. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath, is what that says. So the Sabbath is the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments. Who has power over the commandments. God. God has power over the Ten Commandments. So again, he's saying, I am God. I have power over the Ten Commandments. And then last, this climactic moment where they have him on trial and they're accusing him and the men are giving testimony of what he claimed. We see in Mark 14, 62, I want to give you a few verses before that to give you a little bit of context. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah? Meaning, are you the Christ? The Son of the Blessed One. And then Jesus responded and said, I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, and coming on the clouds of heaven. So he definitely is saying, I am the Christ, but then he uses this crazy, weird, I'm coming on the clouds. I'm the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, and coming on the clouds. What does that sound like? So those who know the Old Testament, which in full transparency, I didn't, right? I have to study these things, so I encourage you, study these things. But if you look at the Old Testament, it's amazing. This is Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Let me give you the frame of reference of Daniel chapter 7. This is when Daniel, the prophet, is looking in the sky. He's having this vision. He's looking in the sky, and he sees the Ancient of Days. And he sees angels worshiping the Ancient of Days. So he sees angels worshiping God. And then, in verse 13, it picks up, and it says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. Does that sound familiar? Ooh, it gives you chills a little bit. That, I mean, they, it, he's saying the son of man. What's interesting here, right, is that here's Yahweh, here's God, and here's the son of man. What I didn't realize is, did you know that the only one that comes on the clouds is God, is Yahweh? In the Bible, when you look how God comes, he comes on the cloud. He's the only one. So here's the ancient of days, God, and then you have the son of man, and he's coming like a God. And then it goes on to say, he approached the ancient of days, was led into his presence, and he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. Who has glory, authority, and sovereign power in heaven? Because remember, they're in the presence of of the ancient of days. They're in heaven. Who has that? God does. And, and this son of man is given the authority, the glory, and the sovereign power of Yahweh. Because only Yahweh has that in heaven. It gets even better. <laughs> then it says, all nations and people of every language will serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Here was what blew my mind in the study of this. 
And I can't take credit for it. I, I, it was Ravi Zacharias' team or whatever that pointed this out to me. But do you know this word serve, I have it underlined, is used 130 times in the scriptures? And every single time, it's in a service to Yahweh. It is only used in service to Yahweh. But yet, in this passage, it's to the Son of Man. You see where it's going? So here's someone, here's the ancient of days, Yahweh. This person is, looks like the Son of Man, is coming on the clouds, has all glory, authority, sovereign power. Not only that, it's going to be served just like Yahweh has been served. And more than that, it's going to have dominion in a kingdom that lasts forever. And this was written hundreds of years before Jesus came. That's the power of the messianic prophecy. It's hundreds of years before Jesus came. I have to point out that if you go to the next slide, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power. There's another reference here that's happening. It's Psalms 110.1. In Psalms 110, it says, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool or a footstool for your feet. So Jesus, when they say, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one, and he goes, I am, you know what he's saying? You know that guy from chapter 7 in Daniel? They say he's coming on the clouds, he's going to have all glory, authority, sovereign power, that's going to have dominion in a kingdom that reigns. That is me. That is me. He's saying all that in that one little statement. Isn't that powerful? So can you see beyond a shadow of a doubt, you cannot deny if nine out of ten Americans believe God exists, you cannot deny who he claims to be. Or Jesus exists, you cannot deny who he claims to be. So let's, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to speed up. So let's go through what those who knew him claim him to be. Because remember, I can tell you I'm the best looking guy in the world. But those who know me, well maybe my wife would agree. But she's not here so I can say that. All right, so first is, let's look at, I, I want to look at Peter and John are followers of Jesus. So these are like revved up followers of Jesus. So the reason why I've picked a lot of different people here is because, you know, if you're going to get a diehard fan, they, they might do anything, right? So Peter and John could be perceived as, well, they would say anything and they would believe anything, right? But I'm going to walk you through all these people, and you're going to see why it's so clear that he must be something great. Peter claimed Jesus was God. So, in uh, Matthew 16, 13 through 17, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say you're John the Baptist, others say you're Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or of the prophets. Then Jesus said, but what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. So Peter is testifying, you are the Messiah. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. So there's Peter's claim. He knew Jesus, walked with him, talked with him, lived life with him. He knew him. Let's go to John. John, in 1, 1 through 2, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And I'm going to skip ahead. John 1, 14, so in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, which is a whole study in and of itself. But then in John 1, 14, he says, the Word became flesh and made its dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. There's witness number two who walked with Jesus in, in claiming he is the Son of God. So let's move to Thomas. Why did I pick Thomas? Well, like I said, these people can be pushed aside. Maybe they're just raving fans. They would believe anything. But Thomas, in, in the records that we have, he denies. He says, I will not believe. Let's read it. He goes, so the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. So this guy is not a raving fan. You can't make that argument with him. And then we know the story. Jesus shows up. Thomas believes and claims he's God. Then let's move on to James. And James is the most interesting one. Do you know why? <laughs> Because he's the half-brother of Jesus. 
My dad gave me an unbelievable analogy as I was asking him for advice on this uh, sermon. And he goes, tell him, he goes, you have five brothers and two sisters. What would it take for Dan, you guys remember Dan, my brother? What would it take for Dan to start calling me God? And not only start calling me God, but start living his life in correlation to him recognizing I'm God. Think how crazy that is. His own brother who grew up with him, who lived beside him. And the crazy thing about James, when you look at it, is James did not believe. He did not believe in Jesus at first. So in James 1.1, which is the epistle, James opens up by saying this, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the tw- 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. So he's claiming, I am a servant of God and I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you look, James did not believe in Jesus, neither did the other three brothers. They didn't give him respect, and you can look at this in John 7, 3 through 5. In verse 5 it says, for neither did his brothers believe in him. So they did not believe Then, however, after the resurrection, James and his brothers joined the company of believers, now convinced Jesus was indeed the promised Messiah and Son of God, which is found in Acts 1.14. So James, totally 180, starts believing. Imagine my, my brother Dan. First off, imagine that I'm born, or I existed before 1988, August 22nd, 1988. My own brother is calling me God now and following in my footsteps. How... Crazy, but yet amazing, is it? It's all too, there must be some big revelation there that happened for James to do that. Stephen, I pick Stephen, why? Because Stephen was being stoned, and he went to the death. He went to the death for his belief. So it says, you know, when he was dying, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then I chose Paul. Why did I choose Paul? I chose Paul because Paul is intelligent. He's super intelligent. He understands the scriptures better than most. He was killing Christians. But yet Paul was met on the side of the road. Saul was met, really, on the side of the road and turned to Paul. And Paul claims in Titus 2.13, but in many other places, let us live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And now I'm going to skip the last one for the sake of time, but you get the point. Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews claimed Jesus was God. And what's interesting about this one, Hebrews 1.8, and this is homework for you guys, you can do it at home if you want, is a fulfillment of Psalms 45, 6-7. So what the Hebrews writer says in, it is the same thing that was said in Psalms 45, 6-7. So the last one I want to show you guys from a witness standpoint or from a claim standpoint is what is called a hostile witness. I learned this again in my study, that there's nothing that's more credible, they say, than a hostile witness. What does that mean? Well, it means that if Ben was suing me and prosecuting me in a court of law, and he's against me, and I state my statement, and I go, I was here on Tuesday the 13th at 3.30, and Ben agrees, do you believe it? Ben goes, he was there. But because he's hostile to me, He's that much more credible when he states the same fact that I stated. Because he, has, because he would want to lie. He would want to make it where my life is you know, messed up. So Jesus, if you look at these hostile, this hostile witness, this is just one instance. Matthew 27, 37 through 43, this is when he was on the cross And the two rebels were crucified beside him, one on his right, one on his left. And if you go all the way down to verse 43, it says, He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. So here is a hostile witness, again, saying what? He said it. He said he's the Son of God. So now we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus, nine out of ten Americans believe he existed, He was a historical figure. I don't know how you argue with who he claimed to be. So here's the the trilemma we face. We can go to the next slide, please. And this was done by C.S. Lewis. Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. And I want to walk you through, I call it a workflow, but kind of like the mathematics in a way or the alternatives of how you follow this logic through. So let's work this logic out. So Jesus claimed to be God, so he claimed to be Lord. There's two alternatives here. 
his claims were false or his claims were true. So let's do the first alternative, which is false. We can go to the next slide. His claims were false. So Jesus claimed to be God. His claims were false. Two alternatives. He either knew his claims were false or he did not know his claims were false. Next slide, please. Let's say that he knew his claims were false. Jesus claimed to be God. He knew his claims were false, which what means logically? He made a deliberate misrepresentation of who he is. He's a liar. You see how that logic goes? Now let's go to the next one. Jesus claimed to be God. He did not know his claims were false. So if he did not know his claims were false, he obviously was sincerely deluded, psychotic, a lunatic. Why do I say that? Because here's a man that said, Carl, you're going to burn in hell. Unless you come through me, unless you believe in me, now I'm kind of dramatizing how he probably said it, but you get what my statement is. He's saying, Janus, I'm the only way. Not only that, Ben, eat my body, drink my blood. Remember me? He's a lunatic. I'm not discounting some of the good things he might have done. But logically, he can't be considered a great man, a moral prophet. He can't be considered what Islam calls him or the Jehovah Witnesses call him. Because how does it reconcile? How do you reconcile what he said? So then you go to the next one, which is Jesus claimed to be God. His claim, he claims, his claims were true. He is Lord. This leaves you with an alternative. If you can go to the next slide, please. You can either accept that or reject it. Remember, not making a decision on this, liar, lunatic, or Lord, you've made your decision. So what I want to do real quick as we close, and then we're going to wrap up. I promise it's pretty much done. We're going to wrap up. I want to give you the evidence to support Jesus being Lord just from the messianic prophecies. I believe, I accept, that Jesus was the Lord. I think there's historical proof. I think there's scientific proof. I think there's experiential proof. And then if you look at the messianic prophecies, this, or prophecies, these, this math is going to blow your mind. Did you know the Old Testament was written over a period of 1,000 years? It was 500 years before Christ. That's what they say. The closest you can get it to Christ is 250 years. And that's if you look and study the Septuagint and when that was created and everything. The closest you can get it to Christ is 250 years, but it doesn't matter. The Old Testament contains 333 prophecies according to Josh McDowell. So I, I don't know all the prophecies, but I'm using his 333 prophecies. All fulfilled in one person written 500 years before that person was born. So if Brenda wrote a book today... In 500 years, she's going to predict and, and prophesy what one person's going to do. But what's amazing is the Bible's not one book. It's not written by one Brenda. It's 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament, written by multiple authors over thousands of years. And here's, I, I obviously am not the mathematic guy, but there's a guy named Dr. Stoner, Peter Stoner, who is a scientist, and he wrote this book called Science Speaks, and he wanted to calculate the probability of someone being able to fulfill the prophecy. And he said the possibility of just eight of the prophecies fulfilled in one person is 10 to the 17th power. That number on the screen, I think, is quintillion or maybe 100 quadrillion. I'm not great with numbers, and it's a big number. So it's like, for just eight, he gave this example to give us an illustration to try to wrap our minds around it. Take the state of Texas, how big it is. Fill the state of Texas at two feet across the whole state with silver dollars. Then take one silver dollar, draw a red X on it, throw it in there and mix everything up. Use bulldozers, mix everything up. Take a blindfolded person from El Paso, bring them there, let them wade through. The first coin they step down and pick up, it's the red X. That's the probability of just eight Prophecies being fulfilled. The possibility of 300 plus, I just put only Jesus. Meaning, do you see the, the logic? And then Carl read these three passages today. And we don't have time right now to go through them. I would read them to you. But the passages he read are, are prophecies. Matthew 3, 16 through 17 was a prophecy in Psalms 2, 7. Matthew 22:44 was a fulfillment of prophecy in Psalm 68:18 or Psalms 110:1. Like 
That's just three prophecies fulfilled. And you guys have already learned from David and from Pastor Tim all the other prophecies that are fulfilled. So what's the application of the message? If you go to the last slide, to me, it is, is Jesus a liar, a lunatic, or Lord? I believe the Bible clearly states he is Lord. How then shall you live? Each of you have to make your own decision. But once Jesus is Lord, how then shall you live? Remember, and to reference back to what John MacArthur said at the very beginning of the message, it's an obsession and consuming preoccupation of understanding everything that is revealed about Christ. And to know Christ is to be in his word because in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. To know him is to be in his word. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. God, I thank you for your words today, Lord. I pray that um, you 